Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Scientific Science Podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries and constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com. And this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gill at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Moran Surf, who is Professor of Business and Neuroscience at uh, Columbia Business School. Uh, his academic research uses methods from neuroscience to understand the underlying mechanisms of our psychology, behavior changes, emotions, decisions, and dreams. Specifically, his research focuses on identifying what makes content engaging and how to create narratives that capture our attention. Welcome, Warren. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for doing this. I want to start with one of your very recent papers came out a few days ago. The potential for generative AI for personalized persuasion at scale. Uh, you say here matching the language or content of a message to the psychological profile of its recipient, known as personalized persuasion, is widely considered to be one of the most effective messaging strategies. You say here we demonstrate that the rapid advances in large language models, LLMs, like ChatGPT, could accelerate this influence by making personalized persuasion scalable. Yeah, so I, I, I'm really interested in this one. So um, we have had some personalized persuasion going on for a while. You know, if I go to Amazon, they will show me some products. <laughs> That's sort of personalized persuasion too. Uh, but, but with ChatGPT and LLMs, we could now take it to the next level, right? So we're recording this in March 2024. This is going to be the year of uh, election in the US that is governed by AI. Yeah. Many countries are already gearing up, many candidates are already gearing up, and they're all going to use it. And what they're after is exactly that, personalized persuasion. So think of whatever candidate you like or you don't like. What they're going to do is they're going to try to convince as many people as possible to vote for them or support them. And because they can't reach each and every person directly, they're going to use technology. And yeah. this is not new, but here is what's new. So what's not new is that take uh, Hillary versus Trump, uh, take uh, Trump versus Biden, take any election in the last eight years, going back to Obama or, or even a little bit before, they all knew that the best way to reach you is your email or your inbox or uh, your Instagram or your Facebook or your wall or in feed. It's just that it was hard in two ways. It was hard to get you. It was hard to get you at the right time. And it was hard to know who you are. So step one, which was uh, eight years ago, was we use all kinds of technologies to learn a lot about you. We're not yeah. just like finding you in the right moment, but we also scrape everything you did on the internet. And we learn that you're an extrovert or that you like wine or allergic to this particular nut. And we just know things about you, that you like to spend money on luxury things in the evening, but not in the morning. Or when you're hungry, you're very emotional. We know things about you from your profile <laughs> online. And then we yeah. give this profile to a person, and this person writes an ad that tries to target you, or this person clusters you into a segment and they try to approach you the same way they approach everyone else. So step one was to learn who you are. 
and try to figure out how to talk to you. But now mm. we can do both steps automatically. We can learn who you are automatically, and then we can give who you are to a machine and tell the machine the candidate is Biden. Gil is an extrovert who likes uh, uh, junk food at 4 a.m., who is married, and he's uh, very likely to change his mind if it's raining. And now this is Taylor, all true. The... This is all true. <laughs> no, that is true. I'm all making it up right now. But once we know who you are, we can actually have the generative AI build an ad for the same product or person that's tailored to you. You'll get an ad in the evening that says, when you're frustrated, do this. And in the morning for the same product, it says, when you're calm and by yourself, do this. So they can basically use the power of AI to create both videos and kind of images and text with your profile and then create a tailored message to you. And it would be different to you in the morning than it is to you in the afternoon. It will be different to you after you bought those toothpaste and before. It will be different if you said those words. It's going to be instant. We're going to learn who you are and immediately tailor and add it to you for the same product. And that's kind of what we call personal persuasion, which isn't just tailoring the website to you, but also doing it differently in every time of the day based on your mood and state right now that we can get with generative AI. Yeah, so, so, so reading through your paper, Martin, you know, so the, the problem is not that complex in the sense that I was just thinking, the you know humans are actually very predictable. <laughs> uh, people say you got uh, a brain that is some some say it's the it's the most complex thing in the universe. We don't even know the universe. So I don't know how why somebody would make a statement like that. But um, but we got eight billion people. Let's say I can reduce a human to hundred parameters. We're just talking about eight hundred billion data points. It's a it's child's play. Uh, and so. We, you know, we, so elections, as you say, are we in a situation that the blue AI competing against red AI now? <laughs> I mean, humans don't matter. So we are, I agree with you, very predictable. Uh, the more I know about you, the easier it becomes. And you donate a lot of data on you. I think I read that people write about a, a novel every year. If you aggregate all the text and feeds and so on. They actually write a full novel every year. So you give us all the data. I think that uh, we tend to think of ourselves as very unique and idiosyncratic, but it's not the case when we take all kinds of tests. We can predict very few answers in what you're going to answer to the remaining one. I think that AI is a really good tool to leverage that and make it kind of useful. I do think that the, when the stakes are higher, people tend to be a little bit less predictable. So, you know, uh, when it's about marrying your wife, you might take more time and you might be a little bit more than you are when you buy toothpaste at the supermarket. So, so there's kind of difference in how it is. When the stakes are high, people also tend to uh, kind of reveal sides of them that they don't reveal otherwise. So they maybe uh, hide their character until they can't not hide it anymore. And this comes out. So sometimes all your texts and all your Facebook pictures and all of them reveal only a side of you that is visible, but then the side that makes decisions about things that care to kind of change your life might be others. So there's some room there. Altogether, I'm on your camp in that it's not surprising and it's just like on scale now because people are predictable and just now we can use it. Yeah, so the, the elections are quite an interesting thing. You know, there's a lot going on there. So uh, I look at the US and I see half the country looking left, half the country looking right. And those who left uh, look left, just looking for some way to sort of justify their already biased notions. And same thing on the right. And so it's almost like you don't need a lot. I mean, you just on the margin convert half a percent <laughs> to look right or look left. You won the election, right? So now, many, many years ago, it must be 2016, I think. I was on a panel with a person that since then became very kind of, you know, volatile character. He was a senator from New York before he was trying to run for mayor. His name is Anthony Weiner. And his wife was running uh, Secretary Clinton's campaign. Uh, there was like a big falling. He was in jail afterwards. So he was kind of a, a, a character. But he and yeah. I were on stage. And this is at the early stages of the election between Hillary and Trump, 
when it wasn't clear if she's going to be the candidate or if Trump was going to be the candidate, it was early on, we were on stage and someone asked him a question about politics. And he said something that stuck with me two dates, almost eight years since. He said, I don't even know who's going to be a candidate on the right or on the left yet, but I can tell you already the elections and the <laughs> outcome two weeks before. It's going to be 45% of the country is going to be for the left person, 45 for the right person, and there's the 10% in the middle that everyone's going to fight for. And we know where they are in the US, in, in Michigan and in Florida and in Georgia. And the US is easy for me because I spend a lot of time here. That's not different than Belgium and India and some. It is, it's always the case. Like most people vote exactly the same way again and again. They vote the same way their parents voted. They vote based on things that sometimes are against their own interest. Like if you if you kind of remove the if you put the veil of ignorance and you say here's a policy. Do you support this policy if it was in Sweden, a country that you don't know anything about? You would say, oh, I definitely support this thing. Well, this is the policy in your country, but you vote the opposite. You say, yeah, but it's different here because so so we know that kind of political theory says that. There's a problem of alignment between people's views and their incentives and group alignment. I think you might want to talk about it afterwards, but I'll kind of float it right now. We have a study on climate change that tries to change people's minds, deniers and supporters. Yeah. It's extremely difficult. And the only things that work on changing behavior is either taking to the extreme, making you confront your beliefs in a very visceral way, or making it good for you to actually have reasons to change on the other side. And right now, that's my last sentence on this thing before you can take me any way you want. The incentives are not there. It's more economically and better for a person in Texas to be a Republican, even if he or she don't really hold the Republican view because the, the, state, the, the state and the county they're in are mostly Republican. They get incentivized by that. It, it's their friends are, their churches. So it's very hard for a Texan, I'm making it very kind of template wise, very hard for a Texan to be a liberal, if unless they're in Austin, and it's very hard for a New Yorker to be a Republican. And, and it's kind of like without even thinking about the problem, just by where you're born and who your parents were. So we have a lot of Republicans in New York now, so things are changing a bit. Um, uh, but I remember reading through the paper. I don't have it in front of me. So you could influence somebody. But then uh, Prices get in there, right, in the decision process, ultimately. So that, that's a little different, isn't it? So, uh, in I'll other words, some, some, yeah. All right, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, there, there, there's, we study decision making and change, changing behavior. There are some things that work. You can change people's behavior, but it's, it's either an aggressive thing that goes against their desire and you kind of manipulate them, or it's a long process where they're helping you. So I'll give you an example of each. First of all, if you want to change, that's what clinical psychology is all about. All that you go to a therapist and you say, "I have a behavior that I don't like about myself. It's hurting me. It's making my life miserable. Help me." And you get support, and it's a multiple-step process. It's not mm. trivial, and, and the, the the progression is not linear. You might go to six sessions and not change, and people lose faith, and people kind of give up and they blame everyone and so on. And it's the same process that is true for rehab people kind of having to rehab themselves after bad behavior for disease. A lot of alcoholics say like, I, I you know, I, I feel difficult every day, even though I, it's been only two years. It's not. So, so this is, this is the approach that is kind of from, from within where you want to do it and it's still hard. It's even harder if you don't want it. If all of the incentives are for you to stay and I think you should change your behavior. Persuasion is all about that. Someone trying to convince you to vote for them and you're not open to that. How do they do it? So we learned, for instance, that there are some techniques that work. I'll give you an example of extreme ones and then simple one. Extreme one that was done by a colleague of mine in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So in Israel, similar to the US, you have right and left. And the simplest way of kind of making it tangible for the audience if they don't know anything about it, is that the right is more hostile to the Palestinians and ready to basically go to war anytime against them. And the left is trying to find peace agreements between them. That's the simplest way of, of me saying that. But now she wanted to actually take people from the right who are basically calling for war routinely and move them a little bit to the left. And what she did is she brought a lot of people that were identifying as right wingers and she asked them, what do you think we should do with Palestinians? What should be the solution? And they brought all kinds of things ranging from we should go to a war and kill them all on the extreme to more uh, uh, kind of right wing light, I would say things like uh, we should uh, transfer them to a different country. They shouldn't be here. That mm -hmm. that was the range, I think, of, of the answers 
from the right. And then she brought back those who gave the most extreme answers, who basically said we should kill them all. And she pretended the following way. She said, like, you, uh, Gil, thank you for answering the survey. You said we should kill them all. And that's actually an interesting and refreshing idea. And we're interested in kind of following up on that and, and talk to you about the specifics. How do you do it? Like, should we use machine guns or should we hang them? Or should we? And she basically made people see the reality of what they said. So it's easy to say kind of let's kill them all. And then she said, OK, and what if someone resists and tries to not kind of, uh, should we actually uh, uh, kill them despite this thing? Or what if someone actually, try, like she basically made them. And what happens is a kind of almost experiment in human behavior. Most of the people said, no, I didn't really mean it. Like I, I, when you ask me specifically, they kind of start walking back. And that's actually a way to make them confront an extreme view and gradually shift the perspective to. So that extreme version of changing behavior, you make people actually see what happens if they if they get to implement what they want. A lighter version, which is what we did in the climate change experiment that you maybe uh, uh, want to talk about, is we took climate deniers. Yeah, yeah. Climate so, deniers. No, no, I, I kind of, so I was just thinking, uh, Martin, so just, I don't know if it's just in your research, but th there has to be some price. So, um, you know, what's the, what's the cost of uh, getting somebody looking left to look right? And vice versa. There is a there's a threshold price there, right? So, and it, it's an experiment one could run to to sort of impute this price. I mean, humans are localized utility maximizers. Let let's get used to it. I mean, we don't we don't you know most of us don't think about you know the the world or the universe or anything like that. It, it just you know what do I do to to get along? Um, and so there has to be a price that allows, or, or there's a threshold value at which somebody would would go in the other direction. Is, is there any sense of what that might be in different countries? So, so there are studies on that. What makes it hard is that within a person, it changes over time. So more information makes you change. Like you might have a threshold on Monday, but then a terror attack happens and you get more scared and your threshold goes higher. So we can, so that's why I think personal persuasion on scale is useful because we need to essentially run experiments all the time and know you are at any given moment. Yeah. On average, people tend to stay, so we kind of can can figure it out. And there are experiments on that, and experiments are, are manipulative, and they go something along the lines of we basically uh, we we trick you into thinking you accepted something that you didn't accept, and yeah. we see when you catch us. And if you catch us, it means that it's more important. To, to, and if you don't catch us, then it means that it wasn't as important as you said it was. And you can go along with it. And that's kind of what we typically do in the lab. We basically trick you. Yes, yeah, so what I'm concerned about from a societal perspective is that we have concentration of wealth. So you mentioned India, 5% of the country holds two thirds of the wealth in the country today. Um, we have concentration of wealth in the US as well. So we are getting to a point that we have trillionaires and hundreds of billionaires. So there's a price to affecting policy. They can throw money around, right? I mean, uh, we have a system where money talks. And so the result is in some sense predetermined by wealth rather than anything else. This is, is what I'm worried about. So there are two solutions. One is that the punishment is not is not proportional to the crime, but to your wealth. There is a, a world in which uh, when you park your car illegally, we don't just give you a hundred dollars fine, which means nothing for Elon Musk, but a lot to a homeless person. But we actually say, okay, you're Elon Musk, your hundred dollars fine is a hundred billion dollars. So we we basically change that that there's there's suggestions along the lines of basically that. Like the and, and it's already happening when you when you set bail, when you commit a crime, they didn't just Kind of give you a number. They they ask you know, what what's the chance that you're going to flee the country based on your assets, and they set the bail accordingly. So so it, there are ways by which we punish you proportionally to your wealth, if that's the case. And also there's another way to look at it, which is if bad things happen, they happen to everyone similarly, even though wealthy people can have a little bit more of cushion, safety cushion. But if a tornado hits a uh, New York's coast, then yes, your house is probably better prepared for that if you're living in a mansion than if you're living in a different place, but not fully. So uh, I'm spending all the time right now working with the government on nuclear war. Nuclear bomb that lands in San Francisco kills 
billionaires and millionaires and <laughs> other people at the same kind of rate. So that so in that sense, like everyone has an interest when it comes to kind of critical thing in saving the world, regardless of the amount of money that they stand to lose or win. That's true. So you have another paper here, uh, which I really like. If you worry about humanity, you should be more scared of humans <laughs> than of AI. So you see here, advances in artificial intelligence have prompted extensive and uh, public concerns about this technology's capacity to contribute to the spread of misinformation, algorithmic bias, and cybersecurity breaches, and to pose potentially existential threats to humanity. Uh, you say here, we suggest that although these threats are both real and important to address, the heightened attention to AI's harms has distracted from human beings' outside role in perpetuating these same harms. Yes, I'm, I'm fully with you. Um, I think uh, the human is the most biased uh, machine <laughs> one could create. Uh, to make it worse, once you create it, it's really difficult to reprogram it. So a human is sort of done, you know, uh, when you get hit 25, 30, you're, you're done deal. I mean, all your biases are in your brain. Your brain cannot be re rewired, reprogrammed anymore. And so humans are quite dangerous in many ways, aren't they? So I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll basically echo what you just said in, in the same sentiment, which is if a judge is biased, we can't do anything about it. If yeah. a computer is biased, we can write a new code. We can figure out there's a bias here. Too many black people are being uh, denied parole where the whites are getting parole. There's some problem with the code. Let's just write the code differently and fix it. If a judge is racist, Go, go, good luck trying to change it. So that, that's on biases, for example. And I would say kind of bigger picture statement, which is I have it in, in my mind as like a text on a whiteboard. We hold machines to a much higher standard than we hold humans. Yeah. So the question that everyone who listens to you should ask themselves is what would I do if someone could prove to me without a doubt that for something machines are better than humans? Would I not change or would I change? So, so we some, currently, ask machines to be perfect and only then do we turn to them and if they're just better than us we don't so here's a concrete example in 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 something that everyone understand if i can prove to you that moving all driving to self-driving cars today will reduce car accidents to nearly zero the answer should be let's do it because otherwise there are about 10,000 people who die every year from car accidents but at the same time the way we think is the one accident that will happen for sure with a self-driving car is making us not go there. So we want something else to be perfect, not a single accident for us to move it, even though humans are right now causing a lot more. I work with the government on using AI in big decisions. They constantly tell me, what if the AI is going to make a mistake? I say, what if you make a mistake? <laughs> as long as it's better yeah. than you, that's, that should be it. And, and, and experiment. And here I'll, I'll give you kind of data that would support kind of what I'm saying in an interesting way that everyone can listen and ask for themselves. There's a study that was done by a colleague of mine where he brought people to the lab and he said, like, let's say you think you have a tumor, let's say breast cancer. So you get scanned and now someone needs to look at the scan and decide if you have a tumor or not. Now, your insurance pays for one pair of eyes to look at your scan and it could be either a human or a machine. You choose which you want. But before you make the choice, let me tell you something about the two entities that could evaluate that. Uh, humans are accurate only 60% uh, of the time, and machines 70. Now, now choose, do you want humans or machines? And most people in the study chose humans. And then he went and said, okay, let's try another cohort. Cohort number two, machines were 80 and humans were 60. And people still choose humans. And he went all the way to 99%. Machines are almost perfect and humans are 60% and people still chose humans. And then he said, let's ask why. And he asked people, why do you choose the human all the time, even though we tell you the machine is much, much better. And the answer yeah. was, I'm the 1%. Most people said, yeah, but my tumor is so different because I'm coughing also. And that thinking that we're so special, going back to what I said in the beginning about us being so predictable, is what makes us also fail because we think we're better than machines and no evidence changes our mind. Yeah, so it's really clear that anything that is uh, driven by data, large amounts of data, machines are going to be a lot better because humans just don't have the capacity to, to do it. I know that South Korea, this was like 10 years ago, uh, mammogram readings were like, machines were like 96% accurate, humans were like 65 or something. 
Um, and so machines have gone a lot further when there's a lot of data available. But then there's another type of question that you, you're you're talking about here, right? This this is not a decision that um, we don't make too often, like a nuclear war or or something like that. So there there is a lot of data, <laughs> and so is that is that a modality where machines could fail? So so I'll answer on nuclear war something a little bit different, which is the machines maybe are better than us, but we humans still want a human to blame. We want accountability. So even if you can tell me that a machine is going to be better than Biden and Putin and she and from everyone, I think we would still choose us an inferior computer because we want to believe that that humans would somehow prevail in the last moment. And also we want to believe that if they fail, we want to have a person to point fingers to, and it's harder for us with machines. So we would take the new wall so that we can blame someone at the expense of not having that. that that's kind of how how much it is. Now, I think that to, to the kind of question on decision and so on, I think we're, we're, as a society, we're getting closer and closer to confronting it. It wasn't a question on the menu five years ago. Now it's on the menu, but still not enough evidence to support the fact that machines are better for us to still believe, but the next year is going to force us to do that. And you're going to have to say, what am I doing as a CEO of a company when it's clear that the lawyer machine is better than my lawyer human, but the lawyer human is my best friend? Or what do I do when uh, I think that the lawyer machine is actually giving me more accurate data and so on, but I can't go have beer with him afterwards? Do I choose inferior results, but uh, the friendly experience. And, and that, I think, is true. And to what you said before, and I'm going to kind of end with that. Uh, right now, we are undermining uh, our machine kind of, that's what the paper kind of suggests a little bit, machine view, because we tend to say something like, uh, well, clearly they're better in data, but what about emotions? My doctor is going to be able to give me the, <laughs> the news in a better way and so on. And it turns out that they're, they're becoming better at that as well. Uh, last year, uh, the Cannes Lion Festival, it's the biggest kind of advertisers gathering, had a competition where they gave everyone a brief, which said something, give me an ad for this product with this demographic. And a lot of graphic designers try to capture a machine one. So machines were better <laughs> in figuring out kind of who we are and how to tap into our emotions. They can now fool us. They can chat with us on, on chatbot and make us do things for them, pretending that there are uh, uh, family members kind of on, on the other side. Uh, there are all kinds of kind of classical anecdotes on, on you know, mm. how machines fooled humans by pretending to be humans. It's going to happen more and more. Yeah, so I don't know if it's just in your research, Mar. So. If it's a closed loop system, for instance, so a machine makes a, a decision prediction and um, it looks at what actually happened. So it gets some feedback on the validity or accuracy of that decision or prediction. And it gets better based on that. Uh, we know humans don't do this really well because when we make a decision or a prediction, we are so, you know, we're sort of done with it. You know, if somebody says this was wrong, no, we're not, we're not really taking that feedback and improving our heuristics, right? So machines look like they have a, a distinct advantage in this dimension. So we basically now kind of were mean to humanity for a while and we elevated machines. Let's let's help humans a little bit uh, come back to the equation. So you're right, humans are uh, not great in taking feedbacks, they're not great in changing perspectives, uh, but we can train for that. that that's the thing. So, so we identified together right now, you and I in 10 minutes and the world in the last couple of months, I think started to identify the problem and also the risk that we're basically giving everything we good at to machines, but we also identified the opportunity. And that is, okay, there's something that we could do better. Our brain is faster, more efficient, uh, has a capacity to hold a lot more tasks. So we can say, okay, let's align the world with our brain rather than let kind of the machines find the best way to use the world. For example, if you teach a person, which is something we do in the class right now, to change their mind. So let's exercise something. Let's, let's put you in a debate club. So it's Gil against Moran. Gil has to argue for I don't know, pro life and Moran pro choice. 
Okay, we just assign two uh, sides and we have to argue. But the surprise part is like halfway we say now flip sides. Mm. Then instantly you have to flip sides. Suddenly it's an exercise that your brain has to confront, which we don't normally do, is how do I deal with having to argue for the other side instantly? As an exercise to everyone in the audience, we can you can ask them the next time they have a fight with someone, let's say you're you're arguing with your teacher or with your boyfriend or, or anything, try to decide before the argument begins that 10 minutes in, you're gonna change sides, but not kind of <laughs> pretend to say, fine, I will agree with you, but I don't really agree. Like really, for the sake, don't even tell them, for the sake of this exercise, decide that 10 minutes in, regardless of what they say, you decide that you agree with them. See how it feels. It feels yeah. extremely different. People, people in their mind say, I'm just saying it, but I don't really believe it. They find all ways to protect this thing, which is we want to continue a narrative of I was right before, that's what I'm here where I am right now. If you practice that, first time it's impossible. Second time it's difficult. Third time it's doable. <laughs> the tenth time you'll get better in a skill that machines are not as good at, which is actually taking all the data, throwing it out, and starting fresh in the middle of processing. And that's mm. something we can beat machines. Yes, yeah, really interesting. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, in 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 England and Europe, I think you know we used to do this. There used to be debating societies. Debates were about not precisely believing <laughs> uh, a position, but rather how to show a position could be right or wrong by by logic. Uh, we don't debate in the U.S. at all. I haven't seen any debates in the in the country. Uh, when I was growing up in India, we used to debate a lot. Uh, this was in the you know in the 70s and 80s. Uh, there is no debate there uh, either. Uh, so. In most of these places where polarization uh, put, you know, one population to one, one side and the other to the other side, there's really no debates at all. Uh, their positions are well understood, uh, concrete, and no assumption changes. Nothing is really going to change them. So we spoke about changing behavior. Let's let's add another bad experience that will do that. Traumatic experiences change behavior. If you're an alcoholic and you go to the abyss, people tend to come back a little different. Mm. Uh, terror attacks, wars, famine, like bad experiences, global pandemics, they tend to bring people back a little bit different with a little bit, you know, it doesn't stand forever. People go back to their behavior, but for a while you, you wake up different. So in that sense, the world unfortunately provides for us a few of those, of those events that mm. allow people to come back different and there are also ways and this is going to be in your wheelhouse very much to create manufacture forceful behavior change by creating the architecture of that for example uh, you know abraham lincoln created a government that was team of rivals he essentially brought people that didn't think like him to be in his government so they would force him to do it the military i i was i was born in France, raised in Israel, and now a citizen of the US. So I, I sit is, as a member of three countries with three different approaches to how to deal with different kind of uh, wartime dynamics. But I think that what it allows me to do is see how each country deals with that. So Israel, for instance, has a very good system to bring in the military people with different opinions and force them to speak. So the system says you have to give each side a chance to speak. I mm. met Elon Musk not long ago and challenged him on a little bit uh, the ways by which Twitter is handling kind of uh, fake data and so on. He said that his approach was, and I think it's not new to many people who use it often, is to take tweets that are controversial, flag them first as controversial, and then send them to mini kind of bubble where people get to talk about them. But he only mm. accepts a tweet as real if two people that he deems from the other sides, so a Republican and a Democrat, both say this is true, then it comes back. So you can take everything and say, like, I built a team and I forced people that are totally hostile to each other to view their perspective on that. And if both agree, then it's true. And this already is a step to do it. Uh, we can play with money also. So so if you if we make you put your money where your mouth is, Mm. and you're losing money. When reality confronts you, you might learn the hard way. So if you invested in building hotels in Miami 20 years ago, 
uh, because you said Florida is great and I love being there. And also all the climate change people are lying. The water isn't rising. You lost money because the water rises in Miami and it floods your hotel lobby again and again, and you have to mm. do something about it. So if you're a billionaire who thinks climate change is not real and I'm going to invest in Miami, you paid with your pocket. And that's another way to learn that you're wrong. So we can we can teach you by putting you in different conditions, which actually end up changing your mind. Yeah, so that's a good segue. Uh, so you have another paper here participating in a climate prediction market <laughs> increases concern over global warming. So modifying attitudes and behaviors you say related to climate change is difficult. Attempts to offer information, appeal to values and norms, or enact policies have shown limited success. Here we examine whether participation in a climate prediction market can shift attitudes by having the market act as a nonpartisan adjudicator and by prompting participants to put their money where their mouth is. Yeah, so this is very intuitive for me. Um, when you put <laughs> your money where your mouth is, you tend to understand a lot more uh, from the, the consequences and, and your decisions and and all of that. So, so, so you have uh, like a couple of experiments here. Do you want to talk a little bit about the, the, the two studies you talk about here? Sure. I'll, tell you, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what's my one line big picture. Yeah. It's easier to argue about the future than about the past. So <laughs> in the US, there are people who still believe that the US election of 2020 was won by Donald Trump. It's going to be hard <laughs> to convince them otherwise. And, 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 you know, they have a lot of like, they have a, a, a bubble of people who agree with them and facts and so on, it's very hard to penetrate that. So, so they wouldn't think, OK, we just believe that because we want to, because it's a, a don't thing that tell us, gives us. They would think that it's the tools and it's very hard to. But I think that it's easier to argue about the future because it didn't happen yet. And in the future, you can do two things. You can argue what it will be. That's a fun dinner table thing. But you can also put your money as a gamble on what it is. And, and here's the critical thing, agree before it happened, who is the referee? And then, so if, if before the election, I would go to a climate, to a current denier of, of Biden's win, and I'd say the election didn't happen, you choose who decides if Biden and Trump wins. Mm. And they give you five options and you say, no, I don't agree that the, this anchor from Fox News is the right mm. answer, but we both agree that this person from, uh, I don't know, pick a kind of benign uh, uh, news outlet that uh, Politico, that, that you can't really kind of uh, say it's like really left wing or right wing. Let's kind of pick that. We both agree that, I don't know, this journalist is the authority. And if he or she says in January 21st that Biden won, then you give me the money. <laughs> we shake hands before, then it's very hard for you to say afterwards, no, but actually I think that the, like you agreed who the referee is before and you put the money. So take it now to the world of climate change. This is one example that we tried. We basically said, let's do just that. We brought climate deniers, climate believers, and we said, you spent a lot of time arguing. Forget to argue for a second. We're going to give you a bet about the future. We're going to set something on the future, and we're going to tell you who's going to be the referee. And you have to agree just to take up the bet and that the referee is accurate. And they didn't agree on all the referees. Sometimes they say, I don't believe the referee. But in the end, they say, OK, this referee, we both trust. Fine. So the bet is, will 2023 be the hottest year on record based on the verdict of the NASA team that, and both sides agree, this team is unbiased. They put money, and then we wait. In most of the cases in this experiment, what happened was that, A, climate believers were more accurate than climate deniers. That's step mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Two, they were also willing to put more money in advance. Because they were so sure, they knew that the science is with them, they also bet no, 10 to 1 bets on the outcome, which means they were really, really more certain. This is a measure of that. Those are the things pre. And the post, that's the most interesting thing that the paper is about. We saw that after doing it enough times, occasionally putting bets, seeing what comes out, materializing the bet, putting a new bet, and so on, the climate deniers actually change their views. So we spoke about changing beliefs. Here's another way, slow, but at the end of this process, a climate denier basically starts getting evidence that he or she lose money because of their views, they have more incentives to change them. So we give yeah. a climate denier a reason to change their mind and something that's also kind of done in secret. It's basically them, it's not public. You can still be a denier publicly, but still just make money from being a believer. So it gives us a way to help them change their mind without having to confront their wife, husband, boyfriend, and so on, and <laughs> say, I'm no longer what I was before. 
Yeah, so I'm a big uh, fan of markets. So, you know, uh, going back to elections, for instance, I only I don't use any polls. I use a predict prediction markets. Okay. And uh, prediction markets basically tell me what the sentiment is. When you put your money in, as you say, <laughs> uh, it uh, it takes a different meaning than you know writing big articles on newspapers or whatever, right? I mean that's all great, but if if I look at prediction markets where people are actually trading, uh, trading um, you know expectations, then I have a much better understanding of where it's heading, um, and and that, that that's sort of universal, right? I mean I was in a pharmaceutical company. Um, we actually instituted sort of a prediction market in the 90s where you know we had a large number of R&D programs and nobody, you know, no senior managers had any clue which one is going to succeed or which one is going to fail. That prediction market basically had a large number of employees to come together and bet on programs with their own money. <laughs> and if that, if that program succeeds, then they get, you know, it's like a stock market. And the predictive power of that was much, much higher than you know people sitting around in a round table and you know making decisions. So I think, yeah, I think that's a lot of value. I mean, I think there's a lot of studies on prediction markets in the last 20 years. They show they predict better presidential election, government election, mayor election. Like they, they're much better because of this very reason you say people put their money where their mouth is and they vote not necessarily what they want, but what they believe. So they might say, I really want this mayor to be elected, but I want to make money. So even though I would put the vote for this person, I actually believe that she's going to win. So I'm just going to put my money there. And in a way, it tells us what will actually happen rather than what people want, which is the kind of Achilles heel of all servers. In polls and surveys, people give you what they want rather than what they believe is the truth. So I'll touch on one more paper, um, which is it's uh, quite interesting. So again, going back to the behavior question. So how many times do you need to view content before it's registered in your memory? And I know that you you actually done sort of physical experiments around this. Um, and so, you know, how many times do you have to see a piece of content before the brain sort of internalizes it, right? So do we have an answer to that? So, so. We have a paper that's I think it's accepted. It's not it's not out yet, but I can tell you the behind the scenes of that. So this is now wearing a very different hat that I have that we didn't talk about much before, which is I'm a neuroscientist first and foremost. And within neuroscience, my style of doing research is unique in itself uh, because it involves uh, neural implants. It's what now Elon Musk popularized by taking our work <laughs> and making it our company. But but in a way, it's it's rare. Most neuroscientists study the brain either by looking at animals' brain, and then they can look inside, or if they work with humans, they use imaging. They use fMRI or EEG, but they look at the brain from the outside and try to infer. There's only a handful of scientists, and I'm one of them, that actually take humans, open their brains, put implants inside their head, electrodes in the brain, and record the activity directly from the kind of surface of the brain or the inside of the brain to understand how you think. So that's the setup. And now we basically ask the question, from looking inside your brain and basically having electrodes inside your memory area, can I see how many exposures to content does it take for your brain to actually register this as a memory of its own? So when you first see, uh, I don't know, 10 students in class, they're only students. They're all the same. There's like 10 different people, but you refer them as students. There's no specialty to A versus B. But you teach them for a few days, and you start to see, oh, this is Jonathan and this is Leslie, and they become their own entity. And then you have a neuron in your brain that codes Jonathan differently than Leslie. And maybe if you become Leslie's kind of close uh, teacher, and she's your RA, then you learn that Leslie in the morning is a lot different than Leslie in the evening, and you now have a different coding in your brain to Leslie morning versus Leslie evening, and, and so on. So, so you can start, So, but brain-wise, it means that first you have one neuron that codes the entire population of, of uh, objects, and then as you get more aware of the nuances, your brain actually allocates more neurons to more things. So now that we know this kind of template explaining of how memory works, we basically mm -hmm. put electrodes in people's brains, and we started showing them things. And you asked the question, how many exposures will it take before your brain splits the memory into two? And the answer on average, but kind of the take message is about three times. So three times of me showing you a thing as its own unique entity, 
will it take for your brain to say, OK, it's no longer part of a group, it's its own thing. And this is relevant for people in marketing, for instance. They ask the question, how many times do I have to show you a T-Mobile ad before it actually registers as a memory, not just like I saw an ad on TV. I don't really care what it was. And three, how many times do I have to bombard you with uh, George Clooney is the representative for Gillette before you create an association and say, OK, this is when I see him, I think of that. So all of those things are relevant because now I can quantify how many times I have to put an ad on TV before it's going to do its job and no more than that. There's no point in putting the ad 10 times because it's already created the message and I don't need to kind of shrink it again so I can put the money in a different geography or different category. And also it helps us kind of make assumptions. I know that now Gil, having talked to me for a while, has a memory in his brain that codes Moran. So now I can... Uh, touch on like what you feel when you see me. I can start creating association between my memory and others in your brain. I can start using the fact that I know what's happening in your brain to control your brain. So the more I know what the mechanisms that control your brain, I can start treating you as a puppet, puppeteer and a puppet. Like I know mm -hmm. that the words I say right now are just kind of going through your brain. They actually create connections and I can steer my words correctly to help you see things differently. Yes, yeah, so there's also a cognitive cost issue here, right? So if I if I take some information in, the next time the information coming in, I, I have less cognitive cost and so on. And so is this true for truth and false? So suppose I suppose I tell somebody that Trump won 2020, and I say that three times. Um, is it sufficiently robust for that person to start thinking it is a true, it's truth? So, so there's interesting kind of take on that. So first of all, the answer is yes. So, so saying facts three times, no matter what, they, they register. There's actually a, a study on the spread of falsehood that, it, so I can tell you this three times and make it lock in your brain, but if I want to really make it viral, I need you to then go and tell someone else. And this is different between false and truth. So, so both of them, if they are heard multiple times, they get seated in the brain, but falsehoods are, so to speak, more engaging, and they make you not just kind of collect them, but also want to share them. So they mm. spread the cycle a lot more. And then what we also know, and that's like a sad commentary on society, is that uh, the brain tends to lose a kind of meta-analysis. Here's what I mean by that. If I tell you something like, is a headline in the news tomorrow that says, uh, Trump said there were too many people in his uh, inauguration ceremony, comma, this is not true. Right. I said basically, Trump says, comma, this is false. I said all the things that you need to hear. I said the truth and I said the lie. But the order by which they were said make it so that the brain actually first codes all of them and then tends to forget number two. And you'll code in your brain, there were too many people in the inauguration, even though I said both things. So, so now there's an entire kind of world by which I have to co control not just like what I say words wise, which is for AI doesn't matter. AI treats them the same <laughs> way. But for humans, I need to make sure that I amplify twice more that it's falsehood. Or I have to change the order by which I say there was a lie told yesterday, comma, colon. This is the lie. So those things become a, something you have to manage. When you're a speaker, you have to think, what will I say? What will they hear? Yeah, that's so interesting. So the order matters. And that also goes into sort of a cognitive cause question. So I, I take X in, and the brain is already doing some processing around it. And then I say X is not true. Now the brain is thinking, oh man, you know, I had to now do something else. Do I really want to do it? I mean, I'm sort of lazy. We don't have that problem in, in computer science, right? I mean, we can just, just erase it without any cause. So, so then humans, in some sense, are not very good <laughs> in making decisions. And this goes back to your sort of the second paper that we discussed, which is, you know, people are very worried about AI making decisions. You have to keep asking, how much better are humans? Um, and the answer to that is not well, actually much worse <laughs> in many cases, right? Yeah, we're not better. Um, I think that. That's the kind of message that that is important to echo in everyone's minds. Um, I think, but we're still humans. So, so the question to ask is kind of, for example, um, there's a world in which machines do everything for us better. 
But you might ask the question, OK, but kind of the meaning in a way comes from making mistakes or from having those flaws. And, and if you give me a world where everything works, it might be more efficient and, and better kind of categorically for humanity. But as an individual, I might find it worse. So what we ask people isn't like what is better or worse. We can tell you before you started, the machines are going to be better, 99% versus 60%. But what do you want? Do you want to live in a world where you get the best? Or do you want to take mistakes that are part of the experiences of life? And that's when I think humans sometimes will say, you know what, I'll, I'll take the chance of a, a mediocre doctor who might misdiagnose me, mm. but hold my hand when he or she does <laughs> that. And in that sense, I think that uh, the battle that we have to kind of land on in the next year, not, not far in the future, is an answer to this question. The, the world is heading towards an answer without us choosing, which is we give up more powers and we kind of cling to the ones we still have. And we might say we want to give up some and take others because we want the humanity of those that we keep. Excellent. Yeah, this has been great. Uh, Moran, thanks so much for spending time with me. It was a pleasure. And I guess I was surprised, but we got to keep to talk about anything in efficient computer-like fashion. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you, Gil.